I'm going to discuss some individual case studies with you. Um, case number one is a 32-year-old female in the first trimester of pregnancy. The frequency of nausea is generally throughout the day. Vomiting a couple of times in the morning, and she doesn't feel good enough to go to work, and she's had some weight loss over the last couple of weeks. She phones the physician's office because of nausea and vomiting, and she wants to know what she can do. She doesn't really want to come in the office at this point. Can she be managed clinically over the phone? That's a question for the discussion period. Um, do we need any other information if we do decide to treat her over the phone? Um, Headache would be a clue that something else might be going on. She might be having a migraine, and it might not just be nausea and vomiting from the pregnancy alone. Abdominal pain is not typically NVP. It might be something else, pancreatitis, hepatitis. And a fever does not usually accompany NVP, and that would be part of the differential diagnosis of some other illness that was associated with fever and nausea and vomiting. So we have to make sure that we're treating just nausea and vomiting of pregnancy and not some other medical illness. And then the drug diclegis is actually approved for use after conservative clinical management has failed. So this is a summary of the conservative things we can try before we give the medication. Um, avoid odors. Ask her to figure out what triggers her nausea. Avoid fatty or spicy foods. Omit iron tablets. Many of our patients now are on prenatal vitamins preconceptionally, uh, because of the folic acid to prevent uh, neural tube defects. But prenatal vitamins contain much more iron than regular over-the-counter vitamins, um, multiple vitamins. And so you can switch her to off a of prenatal onto a regular multiple vitamin or even just to folic acid alone, which is all she really needs in the first trimester until she gets over the nausea and vomiting. Keeping something on her stomach, frequent small feedings, fluid between meals, Bland and dry, high-protein food, and we've, we've talked about crackers at the bedside, but the principle is to keep something on her stomach. This patient has uh, large ketones, and she may therefore need intermittent hydration. We need to check her liver functions, amylase, urine, electrolytes, and we follow their urinary ketones and weight and electrolytes. Um, we get an ultrasound to make sure we have an explanation or to look for a possible explanation like multiple gestation or a hydatidiform mole. And then we go through an algorithm of the different antiemetics. And the goal is to prevent having to get parenteral nutrition because as Dr. Um, Corin mentioned, there's a high risk, like 25% of these people get sepsis from the PICC line and, and that is something to try to prevent. So this patient, when we followed up with her, her nausea and vomiting is persisting, but she doesn't want to take medication. And so we, there's two aspects of that. One, we can offer her the alternative therapies, and B6 alone may come in that category. And stimulation of an acupuncture point with electrical stimulation, the device called Primabella may work, and we've mentioned ginger. But I talk to the patient and I say, well, I don't know if you think vitamin B6 is a medication, but there are two studies that support that B6 alone has some anti-nausea effect. Um, our study, the first one there, we used 25 milligrams uh, every eight hours compared to placebo, and 50% of the patients stopped vomiting and severe nausea decreased to mild or moderate. In a much larger study done in Thailand, they use the same dose as in diclegis, which is 10 milligrams every eight hours, um, and they had significant decrease in nausea and episodes of vomiting reduced also. So we can start by saying take B6 alone or take B6 and doxylamine, um, but when you use the over-the-counter ingredients, which is what we've had to do in the last 30 years, they're not delayed release the way bendectin, diclectin, and now diclegis are. All those medications, if you take them at bedtime, they have a delayed extended release so they work better in the morning. You can try pyridoxin alone or you can combine them, and we've, Dr. Korn's discussed how safe these medications are. And I just made a slide about this new drug, diclegis, was just approved in April. Um, it's FDA category A. The dose is to take two tablets at bedtime. 
um, one tablet in the morning if you need it and one tablet in the afternoon if you need it. That d determination of whether it was needed was done in the study over a five-day period. But it is now the only FDA-approved treatment for nausea and vomiting. So what about acupuncture? Well, there, it has been very poorly studied. There are two randomized trials, one with only 33 patients in Sweden where they gave them real acupuncture versus placebo acupuncture. They used a different site and put the needles in very superficially, and in that study they claimed it helped. But as a larger study, 55 people in England, they used traditional acupuncture compared to sham acupuncture, which was a blunt cocktail stick over a different area. Um, they, these were patients who had nausea and vomiting as outpatients, but it didn't seem to help. So alternative therapies, also acupressure, where you just push on that spot. This is the so-called PC6 point on the wrist, which is the nausea and vomiting spot where you do acupuncture or acupressure or electrical stimulation. Um, there's... Again, not very good quality studies. There's seven controls of this uh, pressure device, C-band or bio-band, with conflicting results and not blinded testing. Of course, in this disease, both groups improve with time, but the largest study did not show a benefit of just pressure on that spot. Now, there's a gadget called the Prima Bella, which is a device that looks like a watch and it has five different settings of electrical stimulation to that point. Um, it used to be called the relief band. It was marketed for motion sickness. Uh, Dr. Rosen did this study with the relief band, but it's the same company and the same thing. It's just got a new name. And uh, the patients were randomized to get an active or a sham device. It was a three-week trial and they had 95 active device patients and 92 controls. And they did have significant less nausea and vomiting in the study group. And also, patients gained more weight in the study group compared to the controls. 77% uh, gained weight versus 55%. And both groups were allowed to use other medications, and 25% of the patients in both groups did take other medicines. Now, ginger, um, there's several good studies of ginger. One in 70 outpatients with nausea and vomiting, they used 250 milligram ginger capsules four times a day. And then in patients who'd been hospitalized for hyperemesis and then were being switched to oral medications, they used the same dose. And in both groups, there was reduced nausea and episodes of vomiting in the ginger groups compared to the placebo. Unfortunately, in our hospital, we can't even get ginger from our pharmacy. You have to tell the patient to go to a health food store, but it's something you can add to a, a regimen at any time. There have been uh, studies comparing pyridoxin or B6 and ginger um, and showing that they have similar efficacy, although ginger does cause for some patient more belching or heartburn, and so you wouldn't want to give it to a patient that's having significant acid reflux. But the studies looking at fetal outcome, birth weight, congenital anomalies all show that ginger's safe. Um, there are six double-blind randomized controlled trials of ginger. Four showed superiority over a placebo, and two showed equivalence to pyridoxin. And there was one observational cohort study where they really were looking at a group of patients to look at adverse pregnancy outcomes. There had been some concern raised about bleeding at delivery, and that did not pan out. They showed no adverse effects on pregnancy outcome. So case number two, this is a 28-year-old woman who presents to the emergency room with severe nausea and vomiting. She's about 10 weeks pregnant. She gets admitted to labor and delivery for evaluation, and she's complained of vomiting four times in the last five days, and she's also having excessive salivation. So what are the antiemetic drugs that we can use for these patients? This is the usual order in which we go through the algorithm. First the antihistamines, then phenothiazines, then the prokinetic agents, then the 5-HT3 blockers, and then corticosteroids as a last resort and past 10 weeks. But none of these drugs are FDA approved for use in pregnancy except diclegis. Now we're going to talk about the antihistamine group at the end. Um, so I'm going to go up to the phenothiazines now, the uh, Phenergan, Compazine, Thorazine, we've, you can use any of them. Um, 
they can have adverse effects, especially of sedation, uh, dry mouth, and the most serious, the extrapyramidal symptoms, which would have to be treated with Benadryl. Uh, we mentioned Reglan, Dr. Corrin did. It's a prokinetic agent. It increases upper GI motility and lowers esophageal sphincter tone. It's a dopamine antagonist. And in small numbers in Michigan, what was all the data we had until quite recently, and now there's that big study that he mentioned, 3,458 women exposed in Israel, most for two, one to two weeks in the first trimester with no risk of birth defects. Now, the one thing you should be aware of is there can be some interactions with SSRIs. So if the patient's on Zoloft or Prozac or any of those drugs, we probably shouldn't be using Reglan high up in the algorithm. Um, and there was one randomized trial of promethazine or Phenergan versus Reglan. Um, they were giving them both IV. They had similar vomiting frequencies and well-being scores. And the Reglan was significantly less sedating. But after that study, the the three patients in that study refused the drug due to pain at the injection site. And the FDA put a black box warning for Phenergan that we should not be using it IV. We should give it IM, but not sub Q or IV. And the conclusion of this study was that Reglan was preferred over Phenergan, except in patients on SSRIs, because it was equally effective but less sedating. And what about the 5-HT3 receptor antagonists? Um, Zofran is the most widely used, um, and the other two, there's very limited information in human pregnancy. Um, on Dancitron compared to promethazine, again, was similar efficacy but less sedating. <laughs> and here's a big study of Zofran and pregnancy outcomes, 1,233 first trimester exposures with no difference in any pregnancy outcome, including any major birth defects. But as Dr. Korn mentioned, it's currently under FDA review because of problems in some patients with QT interval prolongation. And last is the study by Murph Goodwin suggesting that prednisone or methylprednisolone can be helpful in these patients. And he used the dose of 16 milligrams by mouth three times a day for three days and then tapered it over two weeks. His initial study showed benefit compared to Phenergan. <clears throat> there was a larger study subsequently done that didn't show a difference in the rate of rehospitalization of these patients compared to placebo, but it was a very different study because all patients had received Phenergan and other drugs as well as Reglan. But the concern with using any kind of corticosteroid is that it may increase the risk of cleft lip and palate if we use it before 10 weeks. So that's at the end of the algorithm because hopefully you're past 10 weeks before you uh, need to consider using steroids. <clears throat> so this is the algorithm for NVP. This is Dr. Korn's algorithm, but ACOG published a similar uh, algorithm about two years later that we start with pyridoxin and we can add doxylamine, um, and then add um, either Dramamine or Phenergan or whatever your choice is of any histamines. And then the algorithm splits into either no dehydration, where we could add any of those um, medicines by mouth or by rectum, or if the patient's hydrated, that she should get IV fluid replacement. Um, usually with a multiple vitamin, and important to give thiamine if this patient has been vomiting for a long time because thiamine depletion can cause or precipitate Wernicke's encephalopathy. So if the patient has vomited for more than three weeks, be aware that that may be a risk. And then you can see the same drugs in whatever order you choose. Um, so to summarize these cases, the etiology of nausea and vomiting is really not clear, so we have a lot of different therapies, and some may work for some patients and not for others. We should rule out other causes of nausea and vomiting. Uh, we start with the dietary alterations. Diclegis is the uh, drug that's going to become available later this month, and it's uh, FDA category A. And so that should be the first line. And then other anti-emetic drugs and alternative remedies can be used as needed. Thank you. This is the conclusions that have come out of this particular discussion. 
I think you all know that uh, nausea and vomiting pregnancy is a very common clinical problem with pregnant women. And unfortunately, many physicians do not adequately treat it because they ignore it. I can't tell you how many patients I have seen uh, at a free clinic that I do up in uh, Washington. So there's no cost involved in it. But I see all these patients coming in that have been seen for pregnancy other places. And their docs said, oh, there's nothing we can do for it. And so they come to our clinic. And we do try to treat them. And there's a lot of other treatments, as Jennifer did. But I want to ask a question of the people in the audience. Are all of you familiar with how the FDA categorizes the risk of drugs through the ABCD system, X system? That's the way the FDA comes out, and they try to evaluate the safety of drugs. Now, how many drugs, I'll ask you to participate, maybe it'll keep you awake. How many drugs used in pregnancy other than vitamins do you think are approved as category A? Would you say, how many think it's about 20? How many think it's about 10? One person. How many think about five? Can we show that slide? Look at that list. There's only one. There's only one anti -nauseant. One anti nauseant If you take away all the vitamins, you basically don't have any drugs that are supposedly used in the first trimester of pregnancy. And that's good to know that because that is one of the things that women will ask you the most questions about is, well, is it safe? Has it been proven safe? 